Hey, so I've got Nico Muley here, and he has taken time out of his morning to join us and talk about Marnie. So Nico, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so there's so many things to talk about. I mean, Marnie is totally new to me, with the exception of just a little bit of coaching I did on it. But this was a premiered in 2017 at ENO, English National Opera, and then moved to the Met in 2018. Now, um, for those of you who have been paying attention to the last few nights, I've been talking about Donizetti, who cranked out operas in a month or less. That's actually not the reality of contemporary opera genesis, is it anymore? Not so much, no. <laughs> yeah, so could you walk our people through kind of what that timeline might be? I mean, the timeline for these, for the last two big operas I've done um, has been very, very, very um, elongated. So, um, uh, the Met commissioned Marnie in 2013, um, and then you know the process. The process working backwards from the premiere, it's like you you think, all right, the singer should probably have it nine months to a year in advance. That's fair. In, in an <laughs> I got work to do. Right. Um, the orchestra will want it, you know, three or four months beforehand. Then it'll take X amount of time to orchestrate. Again, we're working backwards. X amount of time to orchestrate. X amount of time to write it. Right. Excellent time to develop the libretto. And then if you have the advantage of a, a sing-through or a workshop or a whatever, um, then that creates another internal deadline. Right. So basically, right. I mean, of course, the first thing is getting getting libretto. So Nicholas Wright and I started working in 2014, 2015, maybe, um, just trying to establish what the basic information of the piece was, like literally what happens, um, who's in it, what are we, what are we, how are we addressing some of the most problematic um, uh, plot points, including sexual assault and marital rape and what that means, mm -hmm. um, you know, un unpacking those things, figuring out where things happen in the, in the um, act structure. So there's really, there's really, um, a lot, it, it's a, it's a puzzle. Um, and I can't imagine unless I had a kind of house relationship with a with an opera company doing it much faster than this. It, it really does require that much, yeah. that much um, advance. I sort of find it really fascinating because, you know, sometimes you run into a composer who just takes a completed libretto and then sets it. But I love to see that you were instrumental and heavily involved in the development of the libretto of the story as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, I think you need to be, and also the director, Michael, Michael Mayer, this is actually his idea. So right. Michael, we had we had the advantage of um, Michael and Nick and and uh, you know e e we were all kind of working around a table on it um, mm -hmm. constantly and I think you know again I I something I, I should say about this this conversation in general is you know just because this is the way I've done it this one time doesn't mean I'm saying this is the only way it should be done or that I won't do it differently another time it's it's interesting I, I've noticed you know in a lot of the way opera is spoken about particularly contemporary opera it's as if any effort by a composer is an edict about how it should be done for everyone else. That's not how I think at all. I, well, I feel very- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Certainly, I don't hear it that way because every project's different, but- Right, but I think I, I, think I should just I should just preface Good this enough. by saying- Good. <laughs> um, So that, that's how this happened, happened to work. And it's based on, I mean, we're, my, our audience is gonna mostly know it from the Hitchcock film, but I noticed in just reading some articles and stuff about it that, you actually were careful to base it more on the novel, the Winston Graham novel. Yes, exactly. And how um, did that change your, the approach? I mean, was it a visual, a story thing, what? Well, I mean, there are so many, there are so many changes um, to the novel which Hitchcock made. Mm -hmm. I mean, the most obvious one being that it's set um, maybe almost a decade closer to the future and it's moved from the UK to America, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge difference in terms of, in terms of, I mean, every, every it, that, that makes it just structurally a big difference. Mm -hmm. Additionally, you know, as with a lot of Hitchcock, his interest is in this kind of ravishing beauty, but then also in the sort of sexual degradation of Tippi Hedren. Like that was, that felt like a governing force behind the movie. Um, so we wanted to really get away from that and much more into the kind of first person universe of the of the Graham novel. Um, and, you know, it was interesting, I, I at that time, the, the time when we were writing it, I'd spent a lot of time um, 
I was basically living back and forth between New York and the, U- and the UK, and mm-hmm. one of Winston Graham's other series, the Poldark series, had just been made into a, oh, into yeah, a television yeah. series. So, so his, his work, and I'd reread one of them just kind of recreationally on the train, and so his work was very much kind of present in, in my mind. And when you think about that novel, for when it was written, the, the reliance on the tropes of psychoanalysis was so forward. Um, thinking for for a piece of popular literature. So what Nick managed to do really well was sort of tease that out in a way that's very period, but that registers, I think, for, for a modern audience. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I mentioned, I think we, we just, you know, in full disclosure, we, Nick, Nico and I have had some email contact over the weekend. And so one of the things I was thinking about that I was interested in, uh, it's your third opera, um, Marnie is. Obviously, we hope that there'll be many more, but um, Two Boys was an early opera about an internet relationship. It was a chat room relationship that went terribly wrong. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Dark Sisters is a chamber opera, so a little bit smaller forces, but uh, about a woman trying to escape an FLDS sect, which is going to be familiar to people here in Utah, maybe less so to you, people. Uh, who are listening from other places. Do you find these psychological stories, they're very dark, do you find them compelling or is it just what has happened to come across your plate? Um, yeah, no, I think, I, I mean, I mean, I think I'm just, one, it's things that happen to come across my plate, but the story behind Two Boys to me was one of the fundamental, the minute I was, I was reading about it, I thought this is really, this is everything. Like it has, it has everything that theater should do in it. And it has the fundamental question of, you know, why do we tell lies? What are we looking for? What it, it's the, the fundamental like relationship between two people, like mm-hmm. what that what that is. And I think lying and disguise and all that is so built, it's so baked into the history of theater itself, but also into opera. Right. And it's this idea that that you know you lie to get something from someone else that you couldn't get any other way. In the same way, you know, and that happens in Partenope, and that happens in Cozy, and that happens in, you know, it, it happens, that's, that's what's up. So, so yeah. for me, the story of Two Boys was, was so poignant in that way. And with Marnie, again, it's like, I think, I think of Marnie um, in a lot of ways like Melisande, mm-hmm. where it almost, it's like any time, no matter how you look at it, it changes your perception. So you can go through the, you can go through the whole opera and think she's manipulative she's in control, she's, um, you know, moving these things around, she's a spider, or you can go through it and think she's an absolute victim, or you can go through it and think it's some combination, and you could do that in the course of a single scene. And I think, you know, something like Pallias and Melisande is so vague, because we never really understand, you know, all we know from her first utterance is, don't touch me, right? right. And then, and that's kind of Marnie's vibe too, right? It's this, mm-hmm. it's, this um, it's, it's, control without being in control. And I think that that's a really exciting gift for a composer um, to, to try to write that character. And what does that sound like? Yeah, it gives you a lot of voices to try to express through your music too. Not just one through line, but it's almost right. like, again, I talked the last couple of nights with these Tudor Queens, I've talked about mad scenes and how there's these big shifts and um, texture in the orchestra. And Donizetti obviously did it within his own musical language but I think it offers so much food for a composer. Yes, exactly. I mean, I, and I think in a lot of cases, you know, with, with Marnie, a lot of the basic um, harmonic contours and, and, and a lot of the materials presented themselves like immediately, like what the first draft of Bulbredo, I thought, okay, I know exactly how this is going to work and how this is going to work and what, how the, how it changes at the end mm-hmm. when kind of everything clears out. Um, I, I mapped that out very, very quickly. And, what, and again, what, what Nick gave me for the first draft was so incredibly clear about that, that it, that element of it kind of wrote itself. And then the rest of it, the opposite of wrote itself. And then I tor- <laughs> tormented myself for you know, four years trying to get it close to right. That's amazing though, that Marnie just came together. I'm curious, what if you were to try to explain to non-musicians maybe, or that are, that are listening today, how would you explain the different ways that you show Marnie musically? Right. Well, first of all, if you're not a musician, welcome. Happy to have you here. <laughs> um, and so I hope there's lots of no- newbies here tonight. Yes, good. Well, he- hello, hello. Um, uh, so Marnie, so basically, you know, she's on stage the whole time. Right. And the, the first act is her changing characters and she becomes, uh, you know, she goes from being, uh, 
mild-mannered secretary to kind of vampy to there there are a lot of different costumes that she puts on and i wanted to make sure that her vocal lines were always a little bit jagged and always and always so it never it never kind of goes in a nice line it always goes boop, 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 jump jumps around mm-hmm. it doesn't sound it doesn't sound abstract and kind of like r2d2 <laughs> right no, no no it's it, definitely melodic and lyrical it's it's melodic and lyrical but i i tried to make sure that there was always a sense of um instability to what to what she's singing and how she's singing it and then at a certain point the the end of the first act when she gets tricked into marrying Mm -hmm. um mark rutland it all of a sudden the orchestra stops being her friend it completely abandons her right so Mm -hmm. all the accompanying figures everything every time she sings normally there's an oboe that finishes her lines and she's really she's kind of conducting this thing and then then the orchestra says you're on your own and just turns into this very scary um, landscape. And then in the second act, you'll see that that, um, it begins with her in this kind of trapped environment. Mm -hmm. And as she begins to unravel why it is that she does what she does, like why is she a cheat? Why is is she a liar? Um, Why does she steal? It takes it back to, again, the fundamental sort of Ten Commandments stuff, and then it takes her back to church. And we Mm -hmm. end up with this very diatonic, literally him song music so it, it couldn't it's it, it's it's a journey from jagged to smooth um uh, and i found it really interesting that the music really smooths out by the time she realizes that she can let go of all of these personas and just be herself precisely so speaking of personas i think someone's here to fix the elevator in my apartment so i'm going to let that person in so should we okay, pause for a second one sec Okay, so now you just saw a little moment of reality in the world of Nico and and myself. So uh, we were talking about Marnie at the end mm-hmm. and how when she finally is completely found out, spoiler alert, sorry, uh, the orchestra texture really clears out. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, what, one of the things that I was trying to do uh, differently in this opera was, was to really explore how the orchestra can be a dramatic um, partner in... Mm-hmm in the um in the storytelling and i think that's you know that's something that's really that's really tricky especially as i would say that i'm still kind of a younger composer especially in the world of in the world of opera that what we were saying before about how long it takes to put together an opera it becomes so fast in the last two weeks it turns into this absolute bonkers marathon where everything is happening uh, you know a million miles an hour and decisions that you made, you know, two years before that about like what a clarinet is doing or something, it's suddenly you're, you're it's happening and you have one second to fix it. And, 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 I, think, yeah. and I think something that I want I want people to understand, if especially if you're not from the opera world, is the only time that you ever see it straight through on a stage with everything working at the same time is the dress rehearsal. And sometimes not even then. Right. Like literally, and when I say the only time, I mean the only time. Like you'll have you'll have had stage and orchestra rehearsals, but it'll be like one act or a couple of scenes in a weird order, or it'll be or stop it'll and be, go, or stop and go, or or like there'll be one element that still isn't dialed in. Like the projections won't be there, so you're like in the wrong space, or mm-hmm. there'll be like missing costumes, or you know. And it's not like a it's not a problem. It's just how how this thing works. And so in a lot in a lot of cases, you you can find yourself in uh, you know, ag- again, dis- dis- dramatic decisions that you and the librettist and the director and, and you as an orchestrator have made years in advance um, are getting a, a first outing in the true context mm-hmm. two days before the show opens. And <laughs> so, then you're like, oh, that didn't work like I hoped it would. Right, right. And in this, I should say, I mean, one of, one of the things that was really fascinating about this is that we had this moment where about two weeks before we opened, maybe a little bit more than that, we thought, you know what, there is a whole aria at the end of this thing that is doing nothing. Like it's, it's, it's the exact opposite of the, of the um, show don't tell rule mm-hmm. for writers. Like we were, we were totally telling something in four and a half minutes that could have been, that, that you can do with a single gesture. Right. Like that you can do with, with one eyebrow from Isabel does all that work right? And one thing in the orchestra could do that work. So 
you know, it's a tricky thing to do to cut something like that because you know, the brass writing was like really complicated and I'd spent ages getting it just right and there was this marimba and you know, it was like a whole, <laughs> it's a whole thing. You loved it probably and, when you wrote it and... Yeah, and I thought it was great. And then we, then we were looking, we were doing these, we started being able to run sequences of like four or five scenes in once and it was like, what is, what is this doing here? Like it, it and it was, it was really, really hard to do and we did it and it felt great. And then Maestro Spano and I went to the bar and had a really, really powerful Negroni mm -hmm. and did it farewell and cut it out of the score. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's, and that probably took a lot for you to come to that point because it is, it becomes a child of yours that you've raised and yeah. raised so carefully. Although I will say, you know, it's something that I've learned from, from scoring films mm -hmm. is that, first of all, it's really a great blessing to learn how to be a little bit egoless mm -hmm. about music. And, or at least to learn when you're going to stand up for something really specifically and when you're going to indulge yourself and when you're going to not. And I think with opera, you get to a certain point where you think, is this good storytelling. Like the thing that I want people to do when they go to the opera is have a great night at the theater mm -hmm. or in their houses pretending they're at the theater as the case may be. Um, so I don't want to subject anyone to some like study of mine. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, no, 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 but it's in this really interesting time signature. Like I, I don't, like there are people who, sometimes I want that so, as, in, as an audience member, sometimes I want to go and submit myself to this, some gigantic like oppressive structure. Yeah. And then other times I really just want a, a great night at the theater, which is why for instance, you know, Puccini is so fabulous because you Absolutely. will never have a bad time and you can do anything to that, to those pieces. Like you could, you could set Tosca like on the moon where like everybody is like a space alien lesbian and you know whatever it's still the best because you're just going to have the best because there's no extraneous music in his works there's not there's not an extraneous note i mean it's just yeah. it's an absolute perfection I, I say that all the time i think that puccini gets really short shrift in the sort of genius category because he's so accessible right i mean yeah i mean accessibility in music is a whole different conversation <laughs> right exactly it, it's like we want accessible but then at the same time it's kind of a curse to be called accessible right you want you want like benevolently benevolently repellent or something like that there's some <laughs> there's some sweet spot <laughs> that you'll and you'll spend the rest of your life trying to find it yeah exactly and the more you think the more you think about it the crazier you'll, you'll go it's like moby dick or something yeah <laughs> your white whale um not to drag back the conversation in a direction it doesn't want to go naturally, but I'm so curious about the Shadow Marnies. You have sure. four, four, four Shadow Marnies, and those are four women, uh, two Sopranos, two Mezzo Sopranos, right? Yeah, more or less, yeah. Uh, and they sort of- As in, like, you know, it's just yeah, four women. <laughs> four women in four parts. I mean, yeah. uh, whatever the voice may be. And they are Marnie's inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. Also her memories, I guess. So And her memories and her previous persona and- yeah. How did that device get created? So we've been talking in the early stages, in the very, in the very early stages of, of development. I knew, I, I, the initial idea that I had was that, that we would have this kind of something called an anxiety chorus, mm -hmm. something that clung to her like a virus more, as it were. <laughs> um, and what my initial idea was that you would split out some members of the chorus to like really track her around. Um, and that idea sort of made something like sense. And the other thing I learned from two boys is that, you know, an opera chorus is amazing. And, and you know, to have the luxury of working with the e &O chorus and the Met chorus, it's like the best thing in the world. But yeah. you really don't have a lot of time to do, to do like detailed physical work with them, mm -hmm. just in terms of it's a new piece, you're in, you know, it just, it's just an amount of time question. So the idea of making them kind of do what essentially amounts to like ballet, or not ballet, but you, you know what I'm saying. It was choreographed, it was planned. Yeah, so doing that kind of detail work with them felt like an unfair use of their time. Mm -hmm. So what we decided was to have this little quartet of women who represent uh, a whole lot of things for Marty. So it's her, it's her conscience, it's her, um, they're her enablers, they hand her tools to steal with, mm -hmm. they're her um, shields and antagonists. And what that then developed into also was a wordless chorus of male dancers dressed kind of in suits. And what that allowed us to do was 
almost overlay a Hitchcockian atmosphere of menace to mm-hmm. it. And something that's something that's important to to articulate, I think, about about um, this show is that she is always being observed by everyone. And she's always being judged and evaluated. And even if no one knows that something's, what's wrong, people know that something's wrong, right? It's sort of like animals can detect an issue. And we wanted to find a way to to physicalize that and musicalize that in a way that was special in some way. So the, so the four Marnies, um, the shadow Marnies sing, and we call them the Marnettes, by the way. Yeah, uh, the, the Marnettes, they sing in a, in a sort of non-vibrato style. They sing usually wordlessly. Um, they have their own kind of harmonic language. They have much more stylized vocal lines, which is to say, um, much much more kind of abstract and and shaped. So it's not it's not necessarily lyrical in, right. in structure. Well, and you even say in the um, introductory material that you wanted to have kind of an early music vibe. Exactly. Yeah, an early music vibe, and that that actually you know it's it's funny because trying to ascribe like a really specific dramatic purpose for that. I just wanted it something that was different in sound from what you often get on an operatic stage. Yeah, in terms of, of in just in terms of sound production, so that there's always something a little bit off about it. It doesn't belong in the what yeah or that it's from a different it's from a different world. I think it I mean actually like it has the same effect as I think children's voices in in Benjamin right. Britain's operas. And the fact that we also had a voice soprano in this was, mm-hmm. you know, that's its own conversation. Um I guess it's like all I do is write operas in which there's a dead kid, you know <laughs> <laughs> or two in the case of Dark Sister. Um so it's Anyway, yeah, that's that's the Marnettes, but you'll see also what it what it then turned into. So you know, it started as this one musical idea, turned into another musical idea, turned into an idea about dance, and then um, Ariane made the most gorgeous costumes for them ever. It oh was one of those. It was, it was so fabulous. It was one of those things where we almost considered putting them in the gun safe at ENO because all the chorus members were like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure every Marnette was like, "How much will it cost for me to take this dress home?" No, yeah, exactly, exactly. They're like, yeah, exactly. Like, will the union find out if? <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I what you're talking about, I noticed, because I, I did a sort of cursory, I had to, you know, I was under a little time crunch, but I, I went through the score and I thought that you're talking about people being judged and I loved the scene in the country club where everyone's just nattering on and on and about, about Marnie. Mm. And then I, I just found that interesting, but I also loved when Mark had his aria and he talks about the deer that he saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the top and of the how story. Marnie, in my mind, I conflated Marnie and that deer because she's always afraid of being noticed and caught. Mm-hmm. That's exactly, that's why it's there. That's yeah, it. That was the next like, I'm not saying part. I had a profound thought, but I just was, it, these are things that jumped out when I was looking forward through, this, through all of this. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, uh, how do I put it? Yeah, it, it, it is meant to be, she's meant to be enigmatic in a way that everyone everyone's looking at her from different angles and seeing different things. And then she perceives that sometimes and sometimes doesn't. Uh, what, I'm curious about one thing that I'm, I know we're gonna get to. I loved um, in the second act when she does finally go to the psychoanalyst, mm-hmm. it says in the stage directions that the shadow Marnies are actually on the couch. They're on the analyst's couch and Marnie is just kind of meant to be, and it may have been staged a little differently when all is said and done, but. Those were the directions in the libretto that, she, that it, it looks like it is that, yeah. Yeah. So I found that interesting that Marnie remains dispassionate from the psychoanalysis process. Right. I mean, she eventually, I mean, the, the analysis process does actually re- reveal the key, mm-hmm. but in the same way that, you know, we all lie to our shrinks. <laughs> it's so funny. Literally the minute the minute we're done here, I have like 20 minutes to go to go take a walk and then I have to Skype my shrink. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you have to think to yourself, you know, you have to you you there are degrees of engagement. Exactly. And it seems like it's in, in that in that scene, in in that in that uh, I guess montage is the way the way it's staged, you'll see mm-hmm. um, she kind of elects to check out of her body and let the let the others do the talking. Yeah, and I know I've had those moments with the therapist where it's been hard to really fully engage, so. Yeah, and then at a certain point you're like, you know, why am I on the Upper East Side? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, why did I this? <laughs> well, I'm, I don't want to keep you for very much longer. I just want to ask, you know, we're all sort of sheltering in place. So let's just get a life 
an insight into the life. Everyone's seeing my kitchen right now. We're seeing your, right. your kitchen shelves and your spice rack. What are you doing to stay creative? Are you finding it a challenge mm. in this environment? I, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, it's funny. I've done a couple of these things and I, I'm, I'm going to be pretty uh, brutal about it. Like, it is not good. It, this is a mm -hmm. very bad time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bad time for artists. It's a really bad time for musicians. And just think about, you know, think about opera singers who have had their entire summer seasons canceled. And it's like, it's, it's an artistic, you know, heartbreak, but also logistical and financial. And it's, it is, it's truly something incomprehensibly difficult to deal with. So for instance, like I was meant to, today I was meant to be rehearsing for the UK premiere of my organ concerto, which is going to be mm. tomorrow. And then the, I was meant oh. to have a viola, viola concerto in Singapore on Friday. And then last week I was meant to have a violin concerto in Scotland and with three of my favorite friends and collaborators. Um, and it's like, it, it's not just gone, it's just, it's gone. And it's this, it's a very upsetting and hard to describe. No, uh, I mean our things are not, you know, but I mean, every day I go in to make cal calendar decisions and I find myself deleting performances and stagings. And it's like, every one I delete, I mourn. I know it's insane. I, and I, I remember, I was like, I need to get these things out of my calendar because it, you know, I keep on getting these, these buzzing being like, you know, you have a rehearsal in 10 minutes. And, and I'm like, like, no, well, I don't, <laughs> I really don't. So I, you know, honestly to stay sane, I'm not sure that I am staying sane, but I've been cooking a, a lot and making a lot of kind of dignified uh, meals for myself. I was alone for about a month. My my mm -hmm. boyfriend is weirdly at my parents' house in Vermont. Really long story, not worth rehearsing here. But <laughs> I, I was alone <clears throat> in London for a week, and then I then I've been alone in New York for a month and and change. And every night I would lay the table with like napkins and candles and stuff, and make myself like a proper meal and you know, have something resembling a routine about that. Um, but yeah. it's hard. And then sometimes I just thought to myself, like, I would really like to order a Domino's pizza at 5 p.m., drink six bottles of wine, and then, like, hope that somehow all my concerts will come back. <laughs> so, yeah, anyone listening to this, like, if you know a musician, please give them a big hug and 600 oh, yeah. because they need it. It's, like, it's, <laughs> it's really oh, dire. We, it's dire. And do, because we we can't do anything else. And so it's like, it's on the way. It's like, it's our oxygen has been taken away. It, yeah. And I feel like, and just, and travel for me is so part of who I am and like mm -hmm. deal, you know, it, it's really feels like your wings have been clipped. Um, and I don't want this to turn into a really depressing, no, no, it's not. but I think, you know, and I, I just like, as you, as you watch these operas, like understand that, you know, the Met is the Met, but every opera company relies on a, a core group of people, this is from the Met to the tiny companies, mm -hmm. uh, a core group of people who love this thing so much that they're willing to devote their whole life to it. And then there are people who come from somewhere else and there are people who come from other mm -hmm. countries and there are people who come from, you know, uh, as far away as, as, you know, Siberia to come and, and make this music together. And, you know, if you, just looking at the stage um, of any of the operas from the Met broadcast, you have, you know, countless countries represented and to think that that whole thing has just been paused and canceled you know it's it's a really heartbreaking um thing to think about no no i got it and and i appreciate you being really uh, being real about your feelings uh i know you know sometimes it's not always it feels art, so artificial in these zoom things to make a connection for a yeah this is why yeah but it's good to i i think it's good to be upfront about it and i i feel like you know when people ask me how i'm doing and i tell them the truth <laughs> You know what? They they should not ask if they don't want to know, especially right, yeah. right now. That's what yeah, I told exactly. people. Like, hey, like, how are you? I'm like, girl, let me just tell you three things. <laughs> like, well, um, I mean, it's been a thrill to talk to you. I'm it's sorry it's under such crazy circumstances, and I look forward to when we can talk in person when we're on a project making music together. Uh, let's let's do it. You know, I really, 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 truly love Salt Lake. I, I um, think it's great. So well, I look forward to. I'm sure somewhere along the way, well, our paths will cross, and it'll be somewhere. Can't wait. Like, we will, we, will we will raise a glass behind the Zion Curtain. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, thanks for those of you who are watching. Let us have that moment of, um, you know, love fest. And Nico, thank you for taking time out this morning. It's My absolute pleasure. pleasure. Have a great have one. Have a great day. Enjoy. Bye.